In the last video, we learned how to proportion the girder to avoid local stability weaknesses, and so why stiffeners are needed and how to know which type of stiffeners to use for different situations. In this video, we will calculate the flexural strength of the girder and show how the calculations are different from the standard beams, in addition to how to calculate the shear strength of the girder and how do the stiffeners and their spacing affect it. We will also show how to choose the appropriate size and dimensions for intermediate stiffeners and their welds. Finally, we will analyze bearing stiffeners and show how to determine their dimensions. The nominal flexural strength, Mn, of a plate girder is based on one of the limit states of tension flange yielding, compression flange yielding, or local buckling, or lateral torsional buckling. When a girder is bent about its strong axis with a positive bending moment, the top flange will be in compression and the bottom flange will be in tension. If the bending moment is large enough, the bottom flange will yield in tension. AISC F5 gives the nominal flexural strength based on tension flange yielding as the yield strength of the tension flange multiplied by the elastic section modulus referred to the tension side. And the elastic modulus can be found by dividing the moment of inertia of the section about the strong axis by the distance from the neutral axis to the outer face of the tension flange. The compression flange nominal strength is given by the bending strength reduction factor multiplied by the critical compressive flange stress due to yielding or local buckling times the elastic section modulus referred to the compression side. The bending strength reduction factor is given by the following, where AW is the ratio of the web area to the compression flange area. BFC is the width of the compression flange, and TFC is the thickness of the compression flange. The critical compression flange stress, FCR, depends on whether the flange is compact, non-compact, or slender. The AISC specification uses these generic notations to define the flange width to thickness ratio and its limits from AISC table B 4.1b. If the ratio is less than lambda p, the flange is compact and the critical compressive stress is the yield strength. This stress corresponds to flange yielding. If the ratio is between lambda p and lambda r, the flange is non-compact and the compressive stress is linearly reduced as shown. This stress corresponds to inelastic flange local buckling. If the ratio is larger than lambda r, the flange is slender and the compressive stress is significantly reduced and is inversely proportional to the square of the flange slenderness ratio. This stress corresponds to elastic flange local buckling. The nominal lateral torsional buckling strength is given by the same equation as compression flange strength. However, the critical stress is computed differently and depends on the unbraced length rather than the slenderness ratio. The unbraced length defines the frequency of lateral support and it decides whether lateral torsional buckling will occur. And it is the distance between points along the length of the girder where the top and bottom flanges are restrained from moving laterally relative to each other. The lateral fixation can vary in nature. The limiting length parameters for lateral torsional buckling are LP and LR where RT is the radius of gyration about the weak axis for a portion of the cross section consisting of the compression flange and one third of the compressed part of the web. If the unbraced length is less than LP, there is no risk of lateral torsional buckling. If the unbraced length is between LP and LR, FCR will be as follows. 
which corresponds to inelastic lateral torsional buckling. If the unbraced length is greater than LR, FCR will be as follows, which corresponds to elastic lateral torsional buckling. C sub B is defined by AISC equation F1-1, where M max is the absolute value of maximum moment in the unbraced segment. M sub A is the absolute value of moment at quarter point of the unbraced segment. M sub B is the absolute value of moment at center line of the unbraced segment. M sub C is the absolute value of moment at three-quarter point of the unbraced segment. The shear strength of plate girder is a function of the depth to thickness ratio of the web and the spacing of any intermediate stiffeners that may be present. The shear capacity has two components, the shear strength before buckling and the post buckling strength. The post buckling strength relies on tension field action which is made possible by the presence of intermediate stiffeners. If stiffeners are not present or are spaced too far apart, tension field action will not be possible and the shear capacity will consist only of the strength before buckling. AISC section G2.1 covers the case where there is no post buckling strength. That is, there is no tension field action. In this case, the strength before buckling is 0.6 times the yield strength multiplied by the area of the web times the constant C sub V1, which depends on the depth to thickness ratio of the web. If the depth to thickness ratio of the web does not exceed the specified limit, the web will fail due to shear yielding and the constant is equal to one. However, if it exceeds it, then the web will fail under shear buckling and the constant will be as follows. The coefficient K sub V depends on whether transverse stiffeners are used. If there are no transverse stiffeners, it is equal to 5.34. If there are stiffeners and the ratio of stiffener spacing to web height does not exceed the value of three, then the coefficient is equal to five plus 5 over A over H squared. Tension field action may be considered in interior panels when A over H is less than or equal to 3. If the height to thickness ratio of the web does not exceed a certain limit, then the shear strength will be as follows. However, if it does, there are two possibilities. If 2 times the area of the web divided by the sum of the area of both flanges does not exceed 2.5, and if the web height to flange width ratios of both flanges does not exceed 6, then the shear strength is as follows. Otherwise, it is determined as follows. The constant C sub V2 depends on the depth to thickness ratio of the web and is determined as shown. In some cases, the shear strength predicted by not considering tension field action will be larger than the strength predicted by considering tension field action. AISC G2.2 permits the larger value to be used. Solution of AISC equations without tension field and with tension field action is facilitated by curves given in part 3 of the manual. Tables 3-16a, b, and c present curves that relate the variables of these equations for steel with a yield stress of 36 ksi, while tables 3-17 do the same for steels with a yield stress of 50 ksi. This graph clearly shows that to maintain a certain shear strength while having a large distance between the stiffeners, the depth to thickness ratio of the web should be low. This trade-off can be seen as we move along each of the curves. Intermediate stiffeners are not required when either the no tension field strength is adequate or the depth to thickness ratio of the web is less than the specified limit. Each of these conditions can be satisfied if the web thickness is made large enough. If stiffeners are used, there is a maximum width to thickness ratio and a minimum moment of inertia. 
where I, ST, is the moment of inertia about the vertical axis of symmetry through the web for a pair of stiffeners. And I, ST2 is the required moment of inertia for the no tension field case. And I, ST1 is the required moment of inertia for the tension field case. Raw ST is the maximum of the ratio between the yield strength of the web to that of the stiffener and 1. Raw W is the maximum value of the following from the two adjacent panels to the considered stiffener, where VR is the required shear strength in the panel being considered, VC2 is the available shear buckling strength calculated with the following equation, and VC1 is the available shear strength calculated from either the no tension field or the tension field case whichever is being considered. Transverse stiffeners are permitted to be stopped short of the tension flange provided bearing is not needed to transmit a concentrated load or reaction. The weld by which transverse stiffeners are attached to the web shall be terminated not less than four times nor more than six times the web thickness from the near toe of the web to flange weld. When stiffeners are used, they shall be detailed to resist twist of the compression flange. AISC G2.3 requires the clear distance between intermittent fillet welds be no more than 16 times the web thickness or 10 inches. Proportioning the intermediate stiffeners by the AISC rules does not require the computation of any forces but a force must be transmitted from the stiffener to the web and the connection should be designed for this force. The minimum intermittent fillet weld will likely be adequate. Bearing stiffeners are required when the web has insufficient strength for any of the limit states of web yielding, web crippling or sideway web buckling. For web yielding there are two conditions depending on the load distance from the end of the girder. If the distance is greater than the girder depth, the strength is the following. If the distance is less than the girder depth, the strength is the following. Where K is the distance from the outer face of the flange to the toe of the weld. And LB is the length of bearing of the concentrated load, measured in the direction of the girder longitudinal axis and it's not less than K for an end reaction. For LRFD design, the resistance factor is 1. For web crippling, when the load is at least half the girder depth from the end, the strength is as follows. When the load is less than this distance from the end of the girder, there are two conditions. One, where the bearing length to girder depth is less than or equal to 0.2, and one where the ratio is greater than 0.2. For LRFD, the resistance factor is 0.75. Bearing stiffeners are required to prevent side sway web buckling only under a limited number of circumstances. Side sway web buckling should be checked when the compression flange is not restrained against movement relative to the tension flange. If the compression flange is restrained against rotation, the nominal strength is as follows. This limit does not need to be checked if the ratio of H over TW to the ratio of LB over BF is greater than 2.3, where LB is the largest unbraced length of either flange. If the rotation of the compression flange is allowed, the strength is as follows. And this equation does not need to be checked if the following condition is met. CR depends on the value of the applied moment. If it is less than the yielding bending moment, then CR is 960,000 KSI. If it is more, then CR is 480,000 KSI. For LRFT, the resistance factor is 0.85. Although the web can be proportioned to directly resist any applied concentrated loads, Bearing stiffeners are usually provided. If stiffeners are used to resist the full concentrated load, the limit states of web yielding, 
web crippling and sideway web buckling do not need to be checked. The nominal bearing strength of a stiffener is given in AISC J7 as 1.8 times the yield strength of the stiffener multiplied by the bearing area and the LRFD resistance factor is 0.75. AISC J10.8 requires that full depth stiffeners be used in pairs and analyzed as actually loaded columns subject to the following guidelines. The cross section of the actually loaded member consists of the stiffener plates and a length of the web. This length can be greater than 12 times the web thickness for an end stiffener or 25 times the web thickness for an interior stiffener. The effective length should be taken as 0.75 times the actual length, that is, L sub C is equal to KL is equal to 0.75 H. The nominal axial strength is based on the provisions of AISC J4.4, strength of elements in compression, which are as follows. For LC over R less than or equal to 25, the stiffener will fail due to compressive yielding. Otherwise, it will fail due to buckling as referred to Chapter E of the AISC specifications. To learn more in detail about the design of compression members, please click on the video at the top or in the description below where we discuss these in detail. The weld connecting the stiffener to the web should have the capacity to transfer the unbalanced force. Conservatively, the weld can be designed to carry the entire concentrated load. If the stiffener bears on the compression flange, it need not be welded to the flange. Although no width to thickness ratio limit is given in the specification for bearing stiffeners, the requirement of AISC equation G3-3 for intermediate stiffeners can be used as a guide in proportioning bearing stiffeners. If you would like to see a video with an example of design of a plate girder that summarizes all the information mentioned in this video, please let me know in the comments down below and like this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.